Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode number seven, Objective C. Take it away, Jason. Hey, so I'm biking to work now, which is uh, just pretty awesome. I actually, I didn't know if I was going to, you know, like it because, uh, you know, I like the exercise, but then there's this whole, you know, you get to work a little bit later. I mean, it might take you like an hour to bike five miles or something, right? So um, you spend a lot of time on the bike and you kind of have to, you know, shower afterwards and stuff like that. You are such but, an uh, overachiever. <laughs> I, I'm just saying it. Showering is an overachiever. What does it no, say about you? No, riding your bike. <laughs> no, Thank it's, you. but it's super fun. You know, you get to feel, there's something weird, like, there's something invigorating about like almost dying. literally just taking yourself to work. Oh, yeah. Well, that too. But uh, people over here in California are actually pretty uh, nice to uh, bikers. Like in Florida, I feel like if I had pulled some of the stunts I pulled here, I would definitely have been killed. Like actually, if you're if you're biking and they actually they have a bike lane here, which is pretty cool. But if you're biking in the bike lane, which is on the right side, and you need to make a left turn, you can just swing over to the left lane and take up a whole car lane you know, until the turn signal goes and then, you know, take, make the left turn and then swing back out to the bike lane. Yeah. And this only works because everyone's in on it. Like the cars know you're going to do it. You know, you're going to do it. You stick your arm out. Make sure to do your hand signal. Yeah. We used to have to do that when I was at school and, you know, going to university, that was how it was. You had to ride. And that's actually the right way to do it. You have to ride in the turn lane and block traffic. And people would honk at me and get mad. And that was really scary, but you, that's the rule. Like that's what you have to do to make the turn. Yeah, your only other thing you can do, and I've I've done this like I'm still doing this today on a couple of the intersections where I have to make lefts because I'm just not comfortable yet. You know, you can walk your bike uh, like along any of the pedestrian paths, right? But technically, it's against the law to you know ride your bike like on a sidewalk or a crosswalk. Where there's a bike lane or something, yeah. Yeah, right. Or even where there isn't, I I believe the rule is if there's no bike lane, you're supposed to take up a regular lane of traffic. Mm. Or just kind of get over to the right. So consult your lawyer, please. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But uh, it's, like it's, it's actually it's a lot of fun, and uh, you get some exercise, and um, that's awesome, dude. Kind of digging uh, it. I could use a lot more exercise too, but uh, I'm glad you're getting. Hopefully, you'll just get enough for the both of us. <laughs> okay. The one thing about it, though, at least you know up until now, maybe I'll actually build muscle. But as long as I'm still kind of like indistinguishable from a skeleton. I, uh, I'm, I'm like perpetually sore. Like Aww. every day I'm sore because, so you know, sad. you have this like, you know, eight mile bike ride or whatever. So even if you don't work out, you're going to be sore. So, so what I want um, you to do is mount the camera to the front of your bike, ride the bike. So then, uh, you can upload that video to me and then I'll ride my stationary bike. Okay. I'm like, <laughs> okay. I'll sit on my couch and watch you bike to work. <laughs> oh man. I'm totally going to call, uh, Let's just say somebody I know who may or may not be in my family, um, and I have no brothers and sisters, would uh, uh, watch Sweatin' to the Oldies and uh, just, like, sit on the couch eating, like, Cheetos. And uh, the guy, <laughs> what's his name? Richard Simmons, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard Simmons is like, you're doing great, honey. You're doing great. She's just, like, More sitting there, like, cream. eating Cheetos. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. <laughs> don't don't oh, stop man. now. <laughs> yeah that's right she's like he's like one two really three reach for like... it. <laughs> yeah that's for when you're at the back at the bottom of the ice cream container <laughs> or when it falls onto the ground oh man okay so we have kind of a mini news segment today because we want to talk about how we got into programming but, yeah thanks uh, to a viewer or listener email yeah, a listener uh, suggested that we cover Objective C, which we're going to do, as you know, and also suggested we kind of talk about how we got into programming. I think yeah. that's, uh, you know, really good, two excellent suggestions. And in general, if you guys have any, you know, uh, feedback that you want to give that involves, you know, future episodes, definitely, you know, bring that to our attention. Yeah, it's nice to know that we actually do have people listening to this. Besides <laughs> yeah, our moms. Right. Hi, mom. Hey, mom. How's it going? Well, we're the, uh, I think we're the n- number eighth or ninth podcast on itunes if you search for programming which is really awesome yeah i mean and some of the ones up there are like um stack overflow which is going to be it's going to be a challenge but i think we can take them down yeah joel joel spolsky better watch out 
That's right. <laughs> um, and so, you said we broke 25,000 downloads. Is that right? That's right. 25,000 downloads. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, something like close to 2,000 unique IP addresses um, grabbing episodes. So, so Some um, people are downloading yeah. it more than once. That's pretty cool. Not sure why, but that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Some people, I think a lot of people, at least the ones that have talked to us, are you know getting it on their mobile and getting it again on their on their computer right. and things like that, which is pretty awesome. All right, pretty good. All right, so, so yeah, uh, first item of news we had was uh, the new Wii. We talked about that uh, was that last episode of the episode before. Um, yep. That you know was it going to come out? And sure enough, at uh, E3 they announced it. I guess that was last week, and. Um, they, so it's actually kind of interesting. The first pictures I saw was of this weird like tablet device. I don't know if you've seen these pictures. The thing looks yep. crazy. Yeah, it looks awesome. I mean, we talked about this on the last episode how they tried to do this kind of um, of of experience with the GameCube and a bunch of GBAs, but um, this sort of forces the experience onto you. And I, I thought that environment was incredible. So yeah, I'm really and excited I, I kind of didn't this. believe it, and then I saw the pictures and I was like, that looks stupid. But reading people who actually tried it said it's like it is really fun and really amazing. And like you said, with the Game Boy Advances, you know, that's what they tried to do before. But supposedly, I guess they executed it this time really well. And people said that, you know, you can basically have the normal Wii remotes for everybody else. And one person has this tablet screen and they can kind of be like a different player than everybody else with more information or a different world view. Um, than everybody using the TV screen. And so you can kind of oh, get nice. this, like, different players have different roles dynamic at an even fundamental level. Yeah, I mean, you know, this mechanic has been around forever. I mean, you had the idea of even Dungeons & Dragons, if you ever played that in, like, middle school or high school, or even, I know people who play it today. Uh, you have this idea of the Dungeon Master, who sort of, he has information that no one else has, and he has sort of a certain amount of control and is sort of more like the moderator, you know, as, as the Wii has sort of taken over the family demographic, you, know, you could see playing this with your kids and sort of being sort of the dungeon master and help guiding them to having like even more fun than they could have just playing yeah. by themselves That's on the computer. Cool. Yeah. yeah, or, you know, having it for your football game so nobody can figure out what play you're choosing or... Yep. Yeah, it's yep. kind of cool. Uh, and it's supposedly going to be a big upgrade. They're going to be, said, I think, 50% faster or more hardware power than the PS3. Oh, wow. So, well, you, yeah, I said the same thing. Like, well, that's pretty good. And then I saw some commentary, which was a good point, which is, yeah, but the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 are many years old now. Like, they oh, better be true. able to surpass it. And, um, like, right now, computers are, like, an order of magnitude more powerful than a PS3 or an Xbox 360. So they're actually really far behind as far as, you know, raw power goes. Yeah, I would take that with a grain of salt, though, because yeah. these are, like, specialized processors. And they can optimize um, them because everybody has exactly the same hardware, so they know what it's going to be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, remember, the Nintendo is, like, what, 10 megahertz or something? But uh, we couldn't emulate it until you had, like, at least 20 times that. So um, you could do a lot with uh, with with you know not that much power if it's specialized yeah yeah but it's still an interesting point that although they're going to leapfrog everybody else that they'll probably be absolutely crushed when the next you know the playstation 4 and the xbox 720 come out yep i mean you know i think what will happen is putting my visionary glasses on is uh you know the next xbox and ps that come out will um will probably support 3d if they don't already and we'll all be saying, oh, how come the Wii, you know, is the um, only one without 3D? Kind of like we're saying now, how come the Wii is the only one without 1080p? But I guess they're not going after the the visuals. It's more about the gameplay experience and these controllers. And they really led yep. the way. I mean, now with PlayStation, you got the PlayStation Move and the Xbox 360 Connect, which have been successful in their own rights. But, I mean, they all came years after the Wii introduced this motion controller. Yeah, that's idea. right. That's exactly right. So... Cool, man. All right. You have any news? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to talk about something not as sophisticated or, or eclectic as the Wii. I'm going to talk about Duke Nukem Forever. Um, this article was is titled uh, Bar Duke Nukem Forever Barely Playable, Not Funny, Rampantly Offensive. Okay. And, uh, that sounds like a glowing <laughs> review. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can imagine where this is going. But um, 
you know, I saw the well, don't give preview me spoilers. videos. I don't know if there's. I've not played these games, but uh, I don't know. I haven't just, played it either. Spoil. Actually, okay. I didn't know until today that the game was out. So, um, which is kind of a testament to how bad it's doing. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know, I saw the preview for it, and um, they're sort of really going after this niche market of people who like want to have sort of like nudity in their games, like even. I don't know if have you seen the preview for this no. for this game. So even the boss is basically uh, the top half. It's sort of like this. Keep, keep our clean rating. Yeah, yeah. So so keeping on the clean rating, it's it's basically uh, it looks like a uh, top half of a naked woman, but like if you had textured that in such a way and changed the face to make it look like a monster, like a like a oh, half weird. naked woman torso with a monster head. So it's like there, there's just and even the previews just loiter littered with uh, with you know nudity, and uh, so it's sort of I feel like that's sort of what they're going for and and this is this article really sort of pokes at at uh, at the you know huge weaknesses of this game and I just I thought it was a funny read so uh, so I definitely give it a glance. Okay, well we had two news stories both were uh, gaming related so uh, next week we'll have to mix it up and give something actually programming related. Yeah, for sure. And there are some programming news articles that I was reading, so um, we can definitely deliver on that. We're trying to be more exciting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the hip thing. <laughs> Video games are hip. We want to be with the um, young kids. I was playing, uh, just an aside, I was playing Demon Souls, which is this really hardcore game for the PlayStation 3. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to make it through. Like, the, the graphics are beautiful, and the experiences, it's like I'm getting a lot of enjoyment out of the game. But Basically, basically every time you die, you have to start all over again, kind of oh. like those old Nintendo games. And I'm just so sick of playing like the beginning over and over again that I just don't think I can tough it out. That sounds pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. So, so uh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No. All right. So um, <laughs> we were going to talk a little bit about um, kind of the reasons we got into programming and, and some of our early days and try to remember clean out those cobwebs and try to try to think about what it was like and any sort of advice, I guess. So I guess I guess you go ahead and start it off. So how did you get into programming? Yeah, so I started programming really young, actually. my I come from like a lot of computer science majors in my family, uh, my extended family especially. And so my cousins were kind of teaching me how to program and they were teaching me basic and, you know, how you do like, print your name go to 10 and it would just yep, spam yep. your name on the screen i, I remember that one You're like oh yeah, i crashed so, it with my name it's awesome <laughs> i know it's like it's like and so it's it's sort of like it's like there was nothing and then i created my name like an infinite number of times or, or just a really large number of times and so that idea of being able to create something from nothing has sort of like pervaded um all of my interests in programming thus far like I've worked on this uh, Underworld Hockey Club, this video game that I made from scratch, and I really wanted to see a hockey game with physics, where when you body check the person, there's some physics engine running. And it was kind of funny, and just another aside, I uh, was looking at video games at Target the other day, and NHL 2011 came, has come out, and on the back, back of the box it says, new physics simulation, like every hit is unique. And I was just thinking to myself, it's so funny because I did that in like 2008. <laughs> and so that idea where you should sue one, him. yeah, that's right. I'm no, gonna I'm sue the, I'm Don't gonna sue that. Sony too because I'm thinking of the PlayStation 4 right now. Oh no, um, <laughs> <They're in trouble. laughs> um, but yeah, the idea that one person just you know in their in their basement can uh, can create something that usually takes you know a whole team of people or can change the entire world can create a project that's downloaded or used by hundreds or even thousands of people that is something that's sort of unique to to um to programming i mean there's many different arts there's painting there's sculpture there's uh writing but um but few of those arts allow you to uh you know influence and allow you to get inside the the homes and the minds and the lives of so many people as as computer programming i mean you could write an iphone app for I was talking to somebody today who wrote an iPhone app for deer hunting. It's like the number two or number three app. Like every deer hunter wants needs this app. And even people who don't like deer hunting, for some reason they're fascinated. It's, it's with like this. a deer caller or something? Uh, no, what it is, I guess it 
keeps track of like deer like migration or something and mm. also it you can it's sort of like a user driven content like you can specify like if you know good places to hunt and places to hide where the deer are and stuff like that um and but the idea that there's so oh, many so it's in like square for the forest <laughs> yeah it's pretty much it's exactly it i there's checked so in at the deer stand <laughs> Someone in their spare time just made this app and it completely took off. And I think that, cool. you know, you can be like an amazing painter, but often you need different sponsors. You need to go to galleries. You need to, you know, get your foot in the door. And, uh, you know, now with the Internet, of course, all of that is changing. But definitely when we were young, that was the case. Uh, but with computer programming, even back then, before, you know, the Internet had really taken over and things like that, when we were very young... There was this notion that, like, one guy, like, you'd play Pitfall for the Atari, and it was, like, made by this guy. Like, that guy made that whole experience. And you'd go to the movie theater, and there'd be a cast of hundreds of people to, to create a movie. So this idea that, that you have just this incredible power is sort of what got me into programming. And I think that happens even to today. I mean, what is the the story? I mean, I'm not completely familiar with the guy who wrote Minecraft, right? He was pretty much by himself. until I mean, now he has a team, I think. But he spent yeah. a lot of time doing it. But he pretty much did it by himself, right? Yeah. I mean, he worked on um, he worked on Worm Online, which is sort of an MMO that was kind of trying to be like Minecraft. So it was an evolutionary process. But still, I mean, he created minecraft himself from scratch uh, i think his his online pseudonym is notch okay yeah, i forgot right. his real name but um uh, mark is real person that's what it is yep but yeah so even today one person can make a gigantic impact on the world with yeah. uh, programming i mean he made like hundreds of thousands of dollars selling his beta version of his game yeah he made millions i believe Oh, millions oh, okay i think so yeah so what about you patrick what made you get into programming yeah, so I guess a little similar. Um, my family, uh, even my immediate family, my father is, uh, does programming. So that always is kind of there. People always you know, ask me, and uh, I share this story a lot, and I'll, I'll share it in a minute, about kind of how my dad was at programming. Because a lot of people um, know my dad and, and know that he programs and writes code and stuff and uh, are kind of familiar with that. So they ask me how, how that was growing up with that. And I mean... It's hard to say. It's like one of those things you, you don't know growing up another way how you would have been or if you would have been different. But, you know, I feel mm -hmm. like uh, through his doing or through my mom or through some combination of just family that you always had this thing about solving problems. It wasn't just, uh, you know, th the answer to something was never just told to you. It was always, you know, kind of asked as a form of a question. You kind of had to try to figure out yourself. And yep. um, so that kind of solving puzzle aspect always you know led me to how do i get things done how do i find answers and uh, you know that eventually played well with the first few forays into computer programming similar you know writing some little basic thing that that you know just followed the tutorial and you know oh look it's printing out my name or it's converting a temperature or whatever and it was just kind of cool to see it solving a problem to figure out how do i express this thing in my head for the computer to do and even today when I explain to other people about programming, um, a lot of people just look at me with the glossy-eyed stare like I have no idea what you're talking about. But, <laughs> you know, this, how, how do you tell a computer to do something? You know, even something basic that humans can do really simply, like, so, you know, one of the first things you learn in, uh, you know, classic academia about programming is sorting. And a human yep. has, like, all these different ways they might sort something. But then if you say, well, how would you codify that how would you write down a set of rules or steps algorithm to use a word you know that says how mm -hmm. you do that sorting of you know those those playing cards and they kind of have to think about it and you know a lot of them you know have trouble even figuring that out it's like yeah try doing that for like all sorts of problems all day long you yep. know and to me that's exciting it's like oh this is fun and uh you work really hard trying to solve some little bit of code and then you know just get that excellent feeling of accomplishment even if nobody else appreciates what you just did. Um, and so once I got to that point, I was hooked. And yep. uh, getting there was, was an interesting task. And uh, I, I guess it was just influenced by the fact that even my grandfather um, did write code at one point and worked on uh, some software stuff that was you know pretty early on. And so I, I guess kind of unique being as uh, fairly young as I am 
or and being a third generation programmer um i guess that's that's a pretty good story not a lot of people have grandfathers who 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 program computers yeah it's ironic because my grandfather also worked on some of the first computers like with the vacuum tubes and everything like oh really that. So oh so yeah maybe so, I mean, there's maybe there's a there. genetic component to it maybe i don't know but uh, yeah, so uh, not a lot of people can say that. So that's kind of a, a kind of badge of honor, I guess, in some ways. It's kind of cool that you can always say nerdy things and know somebody in your family gathering won't roll their eyes. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people, you know, a big part of problem solving is being able to, I guess to use your word, to codify uh, intuition. You know, I was playing uh, Professor Layton with my wife the other oh, day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it was one of those problems where it's like, you know, your brother is twice your age and your cousin is six years older than you and half your brother's age or something like that, you mm-hmm. know? And somehow, mm-hmm. like, those, you, you, there's, like, a set of constraints that, like, and then it's, like, what's your age? And the constraints are such that, like, your age has to be some exact number. Right. And so I'm sitting here, like, writing formula and uh, trying to, you know, figure it out and solving a system of equations and my wife is just trying different numbers, like five. Oh, five didn't really work out. Five, you know, if I have five, then my brother's age is negative three. So let's try <laughs> seven. You know, and and by the time I was done, she had already like solved it and moved on to the next question. But but well, when I was story, done, Jason. I know. But when I was done, I had solutions for. I mean, I had the solution, but in a in a way that you know, like a computer could have solved. So in other words, I could have Give written it another a program. Problem, you could have solved it in no exactly. marginal time. Yeah, exactly. And so that's really the thing. A lot of people can solve problems, but being able to do this almost like meta task of writing a program to sort of solve an entire class of problems is is really super challenging. And I think that's one of the funnest parts of being a programmer. Yeah, it definitely is fun. And, you know, like you said, the sense of creating something, even if it's not something physical-ish, like a game or art or music or whatever, but, you know, even just creating programs that run on the computer is is kind of fun and exciting and building them up it's kind of like legos in a way you know you have all these small pieces and you build them into bigger structures and there's a beauty that's hard for outsiders to understand but it's kind of cool uh if you if you know what's going on yeah for sure for sure and then also being able to think when you see stuff in movies that are you know 3d graphics or video games or you know uh jumbotrons and you kind of know what goes into making those work because so much of today's society is uh, culture i I know what you say but the so much of what we interact with every day has computers in it or has some sort of code running to help either generate it or run it or control it and so kind of knowing how that works is very powerful yeah and i mean my opinion might be biased but i've always been under the presumption that everyone should know how to program like even i mean not a specific language it doesn't really matter but just you know a program is basically a set of instructions with certain basic structures like control loops and uh you know if decision statements and just the idea of you know being able to describe what you want to do regardless of you could be whatever like a janitor or it doesn't matter but being able to describe what you do and how to do it in a, in a way that's programmatic, I think is important to any discipline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about our first kind of, you know, our early experience. We talked a little bit about basic, but uh, I know like when I, I first started, you know, I, I did a little bit of basic stuff, but I never really got past, you know, just kind of messing around. Um, but then I, I picked up a book on, on C programming uh, and started there and started to write some code, you know, just kind of entering the examples there. And I remember kind of trying to work through the book and, you know, not at, at that point, I realized that the, it was kind of looking back the first time I really started to click is taking the examples, putting them in, but then not just moving on or just reading the examples, but actually typing in the examples and then like changing it. So I had, yep. you know, for instance, like a program that, converted celsius to fahrenheit so i said okay well let me make one that goes the other way you know fahrenheit to celsius because it should be almost the same right you know so yeah so making little tweaks like that and making it my own and that really led to understanding and so that's actually kind of where that funny story i was talking about earlier came from so i was writing you know this program to do temperature conversion so i was pretty excited that i had you know modified this example you know it was pretty dinky i was pretty young so i Mm -hmm. i you know 
got my dad to come in and I'm like, oh, hey, look, look what I wrote. I wrote this thing. It converts, you know, Fahrenheit to Celsius. So I think he, you know, is like, oh, that's that's interesting. Let me see. And so he types in, you know, some some temperature and it converts and he's like, oh, okay. Then the very next thing he does is he, you know, goes negative nine, 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 nine. He just keeps typing nines for a while and then pushes enter and it crashed. And he goes, oh, your program's broken. You need to fix it. Oh, that's so harsh. So another thing that I learned quickly with programming was, and and I think sticks with me today is, you know, writing kind of error proof code or at least error resistant code or really thinking about you know how are you going to test this and make sure it doesn't crash along with how are you going to make it work yeah that's that's funny man that's intense so so needless to say today i'm really good at breaking other people's code um people (laughs) always bring code to me and say this is ready you know hey can you test it out for me and i say yes i would love to and pretty much within a matter of minutes or seconds i have it crashed oh nice yeah, for me, historically, I, I started off actually writing. I did a lot of writing when I was when I was really young. And, uh, like I, writing you books, know, comics, yeah, poems? Yeah, I know. I wrote a lot of kind of like short stories. Okay. And uh, I read a lot. And I wanted to make a choose-your-own-adventure. I actually made a few choose-your-own-adventures on a typewriter. and um, That's pretty hardcore, you know, dude. It was, it was really hard, you know. I mean, the worst is a typewriter is you make a mistake. You have to just kind of keep going and... I decided, you know, I want to make a choose your own adventure on the computer. So I started off in this program is the print shop. I don't know if you ever used that. I made yeah, like I think reading so. cards and stuff. Yeah. So I somehow, oh, I made like a set of, I used the print shop and made like a set of greeting cards and it was like, go to page three or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty epic. I still have it actually. I, I was going through my stuff and I found it. It's called, it was called a, uh, the race that never ends and it was like eight pages <laughs> um i think i see so this then, before uh, <laughs> if you want the if you want the intelligence test turn this paper over if you want to see the intelligence test turn this paper over it just uh, says on both sides. okay sorry it was so funny because it was like do you want to go left or right you know and it was like do you want to go left down the dirt road or right on the ocean and if you go left, you die. But like, there's no context. It's like you just died. So you shouldn't have picked the dirt road, dummy. <laughs> so did but you then, get inspired uh, to do that from playing like Zork or another well, text-based adventure? So kind of a a weird story. My parents did a lot of like shopping and like garage sale, flea market, that kind of thing. Like that was a common like family outing. And this one flea market, this guy had the Fighting Fantasy. Have you ever heard of these books? N- no, they're um, from you. Oh, okay. There you go. They're basically, and there's an iPhone app for them, by the way. Now someone's converted them to like a iPhone app, which is pretty epic. Um, but uh, it's basically like 400 sections, and each section can be from a page to at, you know even a few lines. So um, a 400 section choose your own adventure book, like this massive choose your own adventure book. And so that's really what got me started into trying to write my own stories and my own choose your own adventure books. After reading tons of those, I, I bought the whole set of like 36 or something books for like $10. Um, and so uh, that really was started the whole thing. And then, and then I moved on to basic, um, you're writing different stories and that. And then uh, from there, it just kind of went on to writing games and uh, from games to programming, uh, you know, websites. And then it just kind of one thing led to another. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess that's a point too. I, I did a little bit, you know, I guess... It was around the same time or a little bit after, you know, when web browsers were first picking up and, you know, not that they were just being invented, but, um, you know, I guess just becoming mainstream as it were, but that started doing, you know, writing HTML, which I guess we should point out is a little different than programming is it's more designing and laying out a page. Um, if you do JavaScript, right. you get into programming, but doing actual HTML is slightly different. Yeah, I mean... I just there's just so many some of my best memories are just geeking out to produce something like really crazy one time i wrote like a little 3d engine in flash just using sprites and then i made this website where when you went to it based on the time of the day it would show you like the scene so it was like this there's like trees and like a lake and some rocks and the sun would kind of go over the scene wow and so if you came in the evening the sun like the wavelength, like I just made the wavelength a function of time or whatever on the light that was being emitted from the sun. Mm-hmm. So it'd look like it was the evening and at night it'd be just pitch black. 
And it's just just some of the times like you create you can create something just like totally crazy. And this was like Flash was fairly new. Action script like I think one or two or something like that. So it's like that's something that like nobody else had ever seen before, you know. That's pretty so, nerdy, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, so a big part of it is just yeah, being able to make something completely crazy. And the technology is evolving so rapidly that any of you guys out there can be on the cutting edge and uh, could be, you know, maybe as we talk about Objective-C, could be using Objective-C to make something on the iPhone that nobody's ever seen before. So so let me ask you a question. Sure. Do, do you think that it's more important to pick a language that people say are uh, good to know or good foundation languages, uh, you know, like people would say maybe Java or C++, or if you have some task you want to do, um, learn the language that does that task. Which one would you recommend for a beginner? Um, I think honestly, it depends on what the task is. So, I mean, clearly, if the task is an iPhone app, it's going to be Objective C. But you know, if the task is a website, well, then maybe you should do that in Python or PHP. Or if the task is, you know, a desktop application, then uh, maybe you should try doing that in Java. You know, so it really sort of depends on what you want to do. I think that the biggest thing for someone who's just starting out, I would say, is to pick, uh, you know, pick a project. Like once you know what you want to do, then um, just you can use these podcasts or you can use any of the resources out on the Internet to try and find the language that suits your needs. Because in the end, you know, not to be blunt, too blunt, but in the end, your first programs are going to suck and they're not they're almost certainly going to misuse the language. So, um, it, you know, you might be writing in Python, but in a way that doesn't, you know, accurately reflect the strengths of Python or, or this. And, and this is, this, this happened to all of us. You know, I wrote a, uh, I wrote this beat em up, kind of like this double dragon beat em up game MMO that you could play in a Java applet. And it was terrible. I just, I used all these different multi-processing libraries that I didn't have to do any of that for. And just the whole thing was that the architecture is a nightmare, but I learned a lot. And I think that those lessons can be gained in really any language. So if your project is web-based, you know, if, if, if it's an applet, use Java uh, or Flash. Um, you know, if it's a website, you can use Python or PHP. If it's an iPhone, use Objective-C. Just pick the language that best reflects what you want to do. Yeah, I'd agree. And, you know, I definitely, I think you hit on upon a, a good point I wanted to call it specifically there, which is that y you'll mess stuff up and that'll drive you learning new parts of the language. So you'll go through some tutorial and it'll be really boring. You're like, I don't, you know, I just want to get started doing my thing. And you'll start doing it and you'll, you know, for instance, you only know how to do while loops and you don't know how to do for loops yet or something. And so you'll, right. it'll be terrible and you'll eventually get frustrated go, there's got to be an easier way. And you'll go look up and be like, oh, that's it. I just do that. And that'll lead you how to learn, you know, and that's a valid way to do it is, you know, pick something you're trying to do and then learn kind of ad hoc as you need the skill to do something that you're not able to do with the ones you currently have. Yeah. And definitely, you know, unless unless you're doing this with you know a core group of people and you're looking to make a profit or it's your job or something like that but if you're doing it as a hobby definitely reach out to the open source community post your project on google code or sourceforge uh you know get get some people interested or at least if you don't want to get people interested make your project public so people uh you know who are interested can contribute and that's one way to learn a tremendous amount uh, my first project actually that when that I that I open sourced was uh, J ISO Man, this JavaScript isometric engine, and it's completely obsolete now. But uh, at the time, it was pretty cool because there wasn't any OpenGL rendering in Java or anything like that. So um, I got a lot of help from different people who really taught me how what I was doing was was terrible. <laughs> and so. <laughs> And taking their advice made me a much, much better programmer. So definitely reach out to the community. There's tons of people just like you who love to program. And, uh, you know, anytime you make something public, you're almost guaranteed that somebody's going to look at it. And definitely stick with it because it, it is hard. It's frustrating. And, it, you know, I, I've seen so many people on the Internet do it, and I was here myself. But, you know, they decide I want to make, uh, I don't know, what's the big uh, – first-person shooter now i don't even know oh, call of duty modern uh, warfare 
some Duke two. Nukem Forever. <laughs> Duke Nukem Forever. Okay. So you you play that game and you're like, oh, I want to make that. Okay. Well, you got to understand, you know, that takes a team of people. In the case of Duke Nukem Forever, like decades. But uh, in the case of another <laughs> video game, like years, you know, and millions of yeah. dollars to make that. And that's not to right. say you can't make something fun, but it's to say that you got to break that down and start learning what you don't know. I mean, that's how the battle is, you know, figuring out what it is that you don't know so that you can go learn it. And it, people say, oh, I want to jump into making, you know, an iPhone game. Well, that's great, you know, and that's a good inspiration and that'll keep you motivated to learn what you need. But you got to start. Don't think the first thing you're going to make is, you know, some crazy 3D, you know, phone game. You know, first start with make tic-tac-toe. And it sounds stupid, yep. but figure out how to do it because it'll teach you a lot. It'll teach you how to interact with the screen. It'll teach you how to detect an end game, like the game has ended, how to start it over, how to have a game loop. I mean, you'll learn tons of stuff just writing tic-tac-toe. Say, okay, I'm done with that. All right, write hangman. Write snake, the you know little snake that moves around the screen and eats apples or whatever. And yep. uh, doing that will begin to teach you things and each one being more advanced will will make you learn stuff. But kind of go through that because that, it, if you try to skip to the end, you're just going to get frustrated and give up. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. And I think that, you know, if you if you go for something huge like that and fail, you won't really have anything to show for it. If you want to go for something big, like some big 3D platformer like Duke Nukem Forever on the iPhone, um, you can uh, you can break it down into modules and make sure that. This is true whether you're a novice or an experienced programmer. Make sure that each piece is measurable. You know, like start off with a little ASCII art top-down thing where you're just running around picking up ammo or something. Like you're like a little at sign running around some world of periods like click, you know, collecting equal signs, you know. Like start off there and work your way up to the game and make sure that you're constantly rewarding yourself. I feel like the biggest, you know, the projects that I that I completely failed on were ones where I didn't have these intermediate goals, were ones where I had this end picture in mind, but I didn't have the steps to get there, and I yeah. didn't have products to show at each level. You know, if you can show the at sign running around collecting equals uh, uh, glyphs or whatever, you know, that's something that somebody else on the internet can say, you know, this guy, at least he's doing something, and he's on a path forward, and I want to join this project, you know? Or, and even just to yourself, you know, you could show your friends and be like, look, I'm a step towards making something awesome. Yeah, and then they may even say, like, well, that's kind of silly. This game's boring. Well, what have you made? Yeah, that's right. Or they might give you, like, really, you know, important feedback. They might say, oh, you know, these equal signs are, are too far away. It's Or they look like impossible. the mi two minus signs on top of each other or confuse me with the equal sign. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, you might actually learn some of the gameplay mechanics just from your little ASCII art drawing. Yeah. And, and I think you can get involved in big projects, but I, I think you got to get in with other people because yeah. they'll help teach you, motivate you, show you what needs to be done. Um, and so I know there are some people who, who definitely learn programming by getting involved in open source projects and starting off by, you know, going through and reading the bugs and, you know, trying to fathom how to to commit some of the bug fixes or even just writing documentation which forced them to go read the code and think about things and get involved and then slowly but surely they began to understand more and more about what was going on to the point where they could write their own stuff and that's another way to approach it uh i think that's probably yeah. a little more unusual i i know a few people who have done that but i think more typical is people kind of starting with small things and building up yeah because usually you know it has to come from you so i mean if you know, typically people want to produce something, that's why they get into, you know, programming and open source stuff. It's sort of like, what, how can open source make me do something awesome? Like, I don't know how 3D programming works, but here's this open source 3D engine that does a lot of that heavy lifting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have seen cases where people have started off just, you know, I want to contribute to something and, uh, start reading the documentation, getting familiar on how the technology works. So, uh, yeah, there have been both cases. And let's not forget another important reason to learn to program is, like, having the ultimate geek credential. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Few classes of geeks are more geeky than programmers. Yeah, I mean, like, if you thought band was cool, programming <laughs> is super cool. 
Okay, yeah. so <laughs> what is your uh, what is your tool of the bye week now that we've got everyone kind of jazzed up about programming and uh, things like that? Yeah, um, so hopefully we haven't lost some of our more interested viewers or they've skipped ahead to this point, um, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, I think we got to understand there's people of all levels out there and maybe some people could relate to ours or at least laugh at us at how silly we sound. But uh, <laughs> my tool of the bye week is uh, uh, something I actually just found called Flow Diagram or ASCII flow diagram, sorry. And uh, on, on the tune of making your own um, first person overhead shooter, or I guess that's third person overhead shooter ASCII art game that Jason's brainstorming here on the show, <laughs> which I fully expect to see uh, by next show because it sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, this uh, tool is a web tool that allows you to make flow diagrams in ASCII art. So you can kind of draw boxes and arrows and lines and, and you know show the flow of a program or of I, I guess anything that wants to show data flow or any other kind of flow and uh, then you know you can copy it does it all te text based ASCII based you know rows and columns then you can copy and paste that into pretty much anything at that point into your code into comments uh, into like a mailing list post or you know just anywhere it's as opposed to trying to make a picture and draw something fancy and complicated and the nice thing about doing ASCII art is it's really easy to edit, right? You just go add a few more dashes or pipes here or there and change it to how you need. So yeah, I thought I mean, that was pretty cool. There's so many times when the best documentation for something is the source code. And so, you know, let's say you let's say you used a bunch of training data and came up with like you let's say you're making a breathalyzer, right? And uh, you came up with a bunch of training data, you he got a bunch of your friends intoxicated and then Oh, I thought you meant people with bad breath, so you got people to not brush their teeth. Oh yeah, so you get people you get people to not brush their teeth and then breathe into this breath sensing device and it spits out a bunch of numbers. And you know, using the different numbers it spit out in your friends testing uh, you know, mouths, you could develop <laughs> trusting data and uh, come up with some equations. And you did all this stuff behind the scenes on your TI calculator or whatever. Uh, and then you came up with the answer. It's 42. If you take the output of the breathalyzer and you multiply it by 42, um, you get the, the stinkiness uh, one or a zero. Breath. Yeah, that's oh. right. A stinkiness between one and ten. Um, so, but you did all this work behind the scenes that nobody knows about. They just see times 42, and they don't really know what's that code doing there. It doesn't make any sense. So you would love to sort of give them a graph or draw them a picture or give them a little flow chart of... Uh, you know what you did behind the scenes and just embed it into the code and uh, this that app lets you do that yeah it, it's, I just found it but I, I think I'll be using that because I've done some stuff like this and I had to do it on my own that was kind of annoying so this person I'm sure was in the same boat and they got tired of doing it and said I'm just going to go make a little web app to do that good for them yep. I'm glad yeah it's awesome so what about you tool, what's your tool of the bye week my tool of the bye week is actually Javi which is very similar. Is that French Java? <laughs> it's French. That'd be pretty awesome. Um, oh, dot de. That is that German then? Yeah. So this would be German. It's a German website, and Java stands for Java ASCII Versatile Editor. And uh, as you can see from the website, it um, it's basically an MS Paint, but uh, for ASCII art. So um, you can sort of like use your mouse and draw like cool lines and shapes and draw bubbles and. It lets you um, sort of draw different types of, uh, uh, you know, borders and embed your text into those. It can also do um, image to ASCII art. So it nice. can, you know, yeah, you can give it like a JPEG or something and it'll turn it into ASCII art. Um, and so this is the same kind of thing where, like, you can wrap a comment block. You can, so let's say, for example, you have a bunch of graphs. You can export the graphs to, like, a PNG from Excel or from OpenOffice. Uh, you can import that PNG into ASCII art using Javi, and then you can copy paste that ASCII art um, chart into your code. I am totally going to do this to all of my programs at work now. Yeah. I'm I just going to get like random pictures of like logos and of just graphs of data and like paste them into my code, and people will just be like, this is amazing. <laughs> I know. I've been getting just kind of beat down. In, uh, on my new job on uh, some peer reviews because I just kind of not, I don't really have the style completely down. And uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll take like some horrible picture off the internet. I'll take and render it as oh, ASCII Jason. art. And, <laughs> and there goes the clean, right? 
<laughs> the clean rating just went pew. Uh, no, but you can you can have a lot of fun with this, and you can also be pretty productive with it. Uh, it's actually quite useful for capturing that metadata. So both of these tools, I think, are fantastic additions to your programming toolbox. And they're themed this week. That's right. The past couple of weeks, we've had we've had a theme. I this believe. This is good. Yeah, yeah. That one time, I still have to buy that thingamatic. I think that's what it was called. Oh. Right? I'm trying to save up enough paychecks. Or there's enough a, there's a lot of paychecks to save up. It's like a yeah, grand, I, right? Oh, uh, no. Is it? I thought it was like $300 or something. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I um, I have direct deposit and direct withdrawal. So it's like, just like all that's left are these tiny increments. <laughs> oh, man, the thing about it is expensive. So we studied this in school. Money in, less money out means more in your bank account. <laughs> well that yeah, kind of rhymed right. that was awesome um <laughs> you got to reduce your expenses and then you can okay sorry yeah it's true this is not the i need to stop buying for that i need to stop buying bikes <laughs> uh okay so, uh, so objective about, c that's right objective c now uh, let's just go ahead and address the three thousand pound elephant gorilla hybrid in the room <laughs> okay which is the fact that uh objective c is is all the new rage uh, because of basically one slash two devices, which are the iPhone and now the iPad. So Apple Apple has kind of a history, which I guess we'll talk about in a few minutes about uh, of using Objective C. And because of the the increasing popularity of iOS devices, I guess as they're known, and Objective C being pretty much the de facto standard of what you have to program in. Um, and because of that, they had this kind of resurgence of popularity that they probably didn't even ever have before. And so everybody's wanting to learn Objective-C because it is the enabling technology to be able to you to write the next great Angry Birds. That's right. Yeah, so uh, do you know anything about the history of Objective-C? Uh, so the way I, I understand it is that I guess it was originally written as a preprocessor for C, similar to which we haven't talked yet about C++, but um, C++ has a similar background where originally people were using C and some other languages like Smalltalk started to come out and introduce these object-oriented concepts. And Objective-C was one effort to try to give C object-oriented support. And they did that by instead of writing a whole new language compiler, as it were, they wrote kind of an extension of the language, which did become a whole new language, that compiled not to machine code or assembly like we talked about last time, but C code. And then you could use your normal existing, in theory, really good C compilers to generate machine code. And -hmm. that was adopted by uh, Steve Jobs' small company that he founded uh, when he first left Apple, which was uh, well, Next. Right, yep. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff you'll see um, in even the notation for Objective-C, which is like NS object, NS string, which is for next step string, next step object, I believe. So you can still Oh, I didn't see- know that. I always wondered why there was all that NS. I, I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Either I, I just made that up and it sounds really convincing. So I'll, no, I'll fact check no, that. No, I think it's true. It makes total sense. So that's kind of the history. So what is it, what is it kind of, we talked about what it's, you know, popularity today is for, but what was it good for? What is, what is the reason it exists? Yeah, so um, <laughs> this is sort of a point of contention, right? Because a lot of people would say the reason why it exists is because it's what you have to write in to uh, <laughs> program for the iPhone, but it does have some 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 strengths that you know sort of separate Objective C from a lot of other languages. Uh, many of them are sort of more geared on sort of enterprise writing, you know, safer code um, and increasing productivity. So one is that Objective C is both dynamically and statically typed. So basically, you know, just to cover that again, if you do uh, in C, if you do int i equals 3, uh, you can't just say j equals 4. You have to say int j. That's, that means it's statically typed. So at compile time, you're going in and typing in what the type is of every variable in the system. This is slow, but it prevents you from having these unforeseen side effects. I mean, imagine if you had 
a round function that rounded a number and someone passed in the word tree. Yeah, your round function, it either has to be smart enough to handle what, you know, to to hand to do something when you when you give it tree or it's just your whole program is going to crash. So, a uh, statically typed language like C is safer in the sense that you know what's coming in and going out of all of your functions. And so you don't have to handle all these weird corner cases. And that prevents errors at runtime. Um, on the contrast, dynamically typed languages like Python, uh, they don't have a type. So you just say j equals 4, and then your very next line could be j equals apple. And it handles it just fine. It's just behind the scenes, it's going and figuring out what j is at runtime and changing that. So Objective-C kind of has the best of both worlds because you can do int i equals 3 and the compiler will know that that's an integer and it should stay an integer. But you can also use this special term id. So you could say id i equals 3. And what that tells the compiler is i can be anything. Like right now it's 3 but later on it could be apple, it could be, it could be a database, a pointer to a database, it could be anything. And so it gives you the strength, you know, when you need to be flexible, like you're writing a user interface and someone might be typing in strings or numbers or whatever, uh, you could be flexible. And when you are doing some kind of numerical simulation where uh, everything has to be afloat and, you know, you have certain expectations or you're doing something that's mission critical, um, you know, you can, uh, you can have that, have that uh, security as well. Th that seems kind of powerful and... I think that is uh, something that is kind of appealing. It's kind of a nice feature, although it seems like it might be confusing. And indeed, uh, I've had experience where that can get kind of confusing to yeah. have both dynamic and static typing. Something else that, that I, I found interesting is, um, it, so it supports object-oriented, and it kind of does it in a way that's different than C++, which is why you know both C++ and Objective-C kind of existed and coexist is the fact that it has a different model for doing the, like the calling of functions with classes and stuff. And uh, maybe you can explain this a little bit better, but I guess it's based on messaging as, a pass, as opposed to function calling. So if you have a, a, a class in C++ and you want to say, you know, this class dot, you know, foo and pass it in the number three, then you're calling a function of that class. You're actually going and invoking some code that's you know done by a, a function pointer, what it boils down to. Versus Objective-C, it's a message passing thing. So if you did what's the equivalent syntax in Objective-C for that, you're not calling a function, you're sending a message to that instance of the object that has, hey, I want to have a message of type foo with the contents of three. And it's up to that class to figure out how to handle that message. Right. So, you know, that all happens sort of under the scenes. You know, on the surface level, it is very similar to C++ where you're calling functions. Um, but, yeah, under the scenes, there is a message passing interface. And so basically what that means is you uh, every, the parameters and actually the function itself that you want to call get packaged up into this into this blob and then sent over to that to that class. And so under the hood what that means is it's sort of it's sort of what enables the dynamic typing is this idea of being able to do message passing. But you know anything that we've talked about with respect to object oriented in the past still holds here. So uh, for example you can have inheritance, you can have polymorphism, you know you could have going back to my canonical example, you know your area interface um, or I guess a shape interface with a get area function that's uh, virtual or returns nothing. And then as you implement that shape, you can have a square where the area function returns side times side, and you can have a triangle where the area function returns you know one half base times height. And at runtime, when you call get area, you might not even know if it's a triangle or a square because it was created minutes ago and it's been typecasted down to a shape. You might have no idea as the programmer um, what that is, but uh, the compiler and the virtual machine know that it's a um, that that's a square or a triangle, and it does the appropriate thing. Yeah. So, um, but I, I guess like you pointed out, I mean that's not tip. That's not really all that applicable to 
you know, somebody who's trying to, to just write in the code is kind of handled under the hood, but it does serve to kind of explain to some of the more advanced listeners, you know, what, what is the difference? Like, why is Objective-C still around? And it isn't just used for iOS. I mean, it's also used uh, on OS X in the Coco framework. Am I saying that right? And yep, that's um, right. So they use it there for doing a lot of the programming of apps on OS X, or I guess applications or just programs as opposed yeah. to apps. Um, I think it's still apps. Oh, okay. I think I think on my Mac it says the Mac App Store. I think. Oh, but anyways. Oh, okay. Yeah, I yeah, used I, to always call them apps. Now apps kind of mean something more specific than I used it for. Yeah, now it seems to be specific to mobile, mobile apps. Yeah. Uh, and you know, another benefit of Objective C is it has a really smooth interface. So basically, let's say you want to use some C++, like the bullet physics engine, uh, in some Objective C app you're writing. Um, now, this, for one thing, I should preface this by saying that this applies loosely in the iPhone and I, iOS world, but this is mainly for people coding on Mac OS X. Um, you can still do some of this on the iPhone, but some of it is very limited. And uh, that's mainly an artifact of just the iPhone trying to restrict you from, you know, coming up with exploits and things like that. It's nothing, you know, inherent to the design or something. It's a political decision. But with that said, you can you can integrate Objective-C and C or C++ very easily. Now, basically, you, you create a C or C++ interface in your Objective-C code. And uh, it just sort of mentions what classes there are, what functions there are that you can call, and things like that. And uh, the API is really straightforward. So if you have, let's say you uh, have this monolithic C or C++ application, and you want to write an OS X uh, you know, GUI for it, uh, that would be very easy in Objective-C because it ties in so well to both of those languages. Yeah. I did some stuff where I wrote some iPhone apps and um, it, it's, you know, it's kind of hard because like we were talking about before, sometimes the best way to learn programming is with really simple things. And you kind of have to do a lot before you even get the, you know, first program up and running on like an iPhone or, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's pretty similar on OS X or even, you know, just the most basic C program is still, you know, probably like 10 or 11 lines of stuff you have to type. Versus just a simple one line, you know, print in Python. Um, yep. So that's kind of a, a, a little bit of a, oh man, this is scary. You, and you have to write a bunch of lines, you kind of don't even know what they mean initially. And the same thing is true in the iPhone, that there's kind of stuff you have to do and set up and work with to even, you know, get something that you can just draw to or write text to on the iPhone. Um, but I, I kind of having roots in C and, you know, you know, I, I maybe I think this would be my advice to people trying to learn Objective C programming to do stuff on on the iPhone would be kind of learn C first because it's simpler in a yeah, way. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, there's advanced parts to it that are really complicated, but you don't have to worry about the iPhone specific parts. Not only will you be have a lot more resources to draw on as far as learning C. Um, you'll have something that's very applicable to a lot more than just the iPhone. And then my experience of of programming the iPhone was that. I was in there, I would do these kind of things I had to do, this little song and dance to get everything set up the way it needed to be to get the iPhone happy. And then I would pretty much just write C code. So, yep. you know, they have all these NS objects you pass around and I would just figure out how do I get a pointer to the data, the array. And then I would just, you know, do regular pointer stuff and C and, you know, just do all my old stuff that I knew have done for years and I'm very comfortable with. And I had no problem doing that. In a lot of ways, um, that code actually ended up being uh, a little bit faster than doing it the way that kind of they recommend to do it um, because it involved less overhead. And so it worked out well uh, for my application at least. Now I can't say that you know universally that'll be the case, but I definitely didn't feel hampered only having a strong C background and not really knowing what I was doing in Objective-C. I was still very much able to write a fully functioning iPhone app that did everything I needed to do and you know, was well received. Yeah, I actually went through something similar where I, um, I made a little board game. Uh, I guess a board computer game. I don't know. I made a board game, but you know, not having the facilities to print large amounts of stock paper, I created an emulated version on the computer. I wanted it to run on the iPhone, and so I was taking this 
program that is actually written in Python and uh, converting it over to Objective C, and uh, it it, uh, it converted over pretty well. So I think that yeah, you definitely. I think that I wouldn't pick Objective C as my first language to learn either. I would pick a pick a simpler language like C or like Python. Something very much like text-based, I think, is kind of key there, as, as silly as that sounds. Yeah, I mean, I think that when I read Objective-C, and I don't know if it's because I started in C, but everything seems a little backwards. You know, like, it seems like, I think things are out of order um, in certain areas of it. Maybe the way that there's ne- there, the things are nested. But I always feel like I'm reading things backwards. I think what it is is... You know how you put the brackets and then you put like the object and the mm-hmm. function name inside the brackets mm-hmm. as opposed to like object parentheses and then or yeah, function yeah, yeah. name parentheses. Yeah, so that is a little bit it's yeah. a little bit getting used to. But one thing that I that should be mentioned is that the uh, Xcode, which is the editor IDE you'll almost certainly be using if you're doing iPhone development, um, has a really nice slick UI for um, you know, creating the UI for your app. So um, kind of like how um, Microsoft MFC used to be, although MFC is, is the devil, but that's another story. Um, they, they have this like nice, re- Mac actually, Apple did a great job. They have this resource builder where you can go in, drag buttons, you know, kind of get an idea, mock up how your um, app is going to look. And then you can double click on the buttons to create a little stub uh, functions and things like that. So, you know, like Patrick said, if you get a foundation in C or Python or, or any other procedural language, Java, um, you could take that to Objective C and uh, be able to do whatever you need to do on the iPhone there. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. And I mean, if, if you really want to make an iPhone app and, and that's really what motivates you, by all means, you know, please go ahead and, you know, learn Objective C. And there's becoming more and more resources out there to do it. And the stuff you learn there will, just like we're saying, other stuff will apply to that. What you learn in Objective-C will apply to other things. For so sure. So that's what motivates you. I, I think it's just a word of caution to be careful to not get overwhelmed by, you know, the kind of graphical nature of this iOS device versus, you know, kind of just starting with simple text-based stuff. Yeah, that's true. Definitely. Because graphics does add, it's fun because it's really enjoyable to be able to see, you know, kind of animations and visually what's going on. That's a really fun thing to do. Um, but it does add a whole layer of complexity that is it's hard, f- especially for a beginner, to figure out exactly what's going on and all you have to do. Yeah, maybe we'll take a little bit of time here and talk about asynchronous. Because a lot of anything you're going to do with the user interface, and if you're doing stuff on the iPhone or the um, you know, OS X or, or the uh, iPad, you're almost certainly going to have to deal with the user interface. As Patrick said, you're not really going to be writing console apps for the iPhone. Oh, but before we do that, mm-hmm. let me interject quickly that um, we've been talking about OS X and about the iPhone, um, but GCC actually does support Objective-C as well. Um, yep. And so you can write text-based command line programs that way. Uh, I don't really know of a lot of people doing that. The only people I know writing Objective C are doing it for OS X or and Cocoa or you know iOS, but um, there are a couple. Um, also, the LLVM C Lang compiler will do Objective C, so you yep. do have options on other platforms for doing that. But it's mostly supported by Apple and their products, so that's where you're going to find. I would dare to even say probably 99% of Objective C development. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay, so, sorry. So no, asynchronous. So. Asynchronicity is something you have to worry about whenever you have a user interface. And basically, you might have wondered this. You know, I write this program, and somewhere along the line, it has a set of instructions. And then when that instruction finishes, my program ends. So how can I write something like a user interface where it's kind of waiting on the user? So you might think of, well, I'll just do kind of like a while true around my entire program. And this while true will just continue to loop and sort of wait for the user to do something. And when the user does something, then there'll be some kind of action. And this is basically the heart of of asynchronous programming. So what's going on here is um, basically you have sort of a while true. So so you have some loop that's constantly running. But then within that loop, it sort of asks a series of questions. And so these questions are getting asked, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of times a second, maybe even more than that. So the questions might be, you know, has the user clicked on a button? 
Has the user moved the mouse? Has the user done anything? Maybe there's an idle function. You know, has a second of time gone by? There's just a series of questions. Now, all this is going on behind the scenes. You don't see any of this code. But if the user has, let's say, moved the mouse, <clears throat> then look for any you know, mouse moved functions in the code. And by look for it, what I mean is actually you tell the uh, um, operating system, <clears throat> or in this case, you tell the application layer. Yeah, called registering. Yep, so you might have some function where every time the user moves the mouse, uh, it draws like a cute mouse trail or something like that. Um, in that case, you're going to register this mouse moved function and you're going to bind a mouse moved uh, callback to one of your functions. So when mouse when the mouse is moved, then I'm going to you know add these little mouse trail pointer, these little graphics. So writing asynchronous code, if you look at the code, what you'll see is some main function that just creates all these callbacks. It just instantiates all these callbacks. Like you might have like main and then you know bind mouse move to my trail function bind user clicked on this button to my submit function all these binds and then just a go and what's going on behind the scenes when you call that go is there's just a loop and it's just going through and waiting for the user to do something and then reacting to it so this is something that as as programmers you know if you're used to writing sort of recipe kind of programs like c or c plus plus asynchronous programming can seem very scary um, but it's something that you just kind of got to get familiar with. And uh, once you start doing it, you'll quickly get the hang of it. The other thing that's, that's confusing there that is worth pointing out is that if you kind of think about, so asynchronous, you know, just means not everything being synchronized and in lockstep. So if you read a normal C program, it's everything is, is operates one after the other, and you can follow a line of execution straight through your program. Or if you've got a loop, you know, you can follow it through each cycle of the loop and then to the end of the program um, or whatever it means. But it's kind of everything one right after the other. When asynchronous comes in, you don't know which parts of your code are going to operate in which order, which is because you bind these functions to certain events and you don't know which one might get called before another. And they can be called while you're off doing something else. And so that introduces a kind of confusing thing to your code where you can't just read it like a book. Uh, and the other thing is that you have to be careful because what happens is is there's a thread of execution that is you know responsible for drawing all the stuff on your screen. And so if somebody clicks a button and in that button event handler, you try to do some complex math like you try to solve the meaning of the universe. Uh, what's going to happen <laughs> is during that time, the user is going to ha not be able to get a response out of your GUI. The buttons right. won't highlight when you move over them. They won't be able to resize a window. And if you've ever seen this happen in a program, that's typically what the problem is. Something's gotten stuck somewhere doing a bunch of processing it wasn't supposed to do in that thread, and now you're not getting a response out of the GUI. So the right way to handle that is in the message, hand, well, handle it in the handler, is to push that work to another thread or to some other something that's going to do that processing that's going to take longer so that, that function can return and the GUI can continue to be updated so that the user maintains responsiveness. Right. So one thing I probably should mention, you know, in addition to in that while loop that I talked about before, where it's checking to see, did the user click a button? Did the user move the mouse, etc.? There's also a, what Patrick's alluded to, a draw the screen. And, and as he's saying, if you interrupt that while loop, if you halt that while loop by you know, solving the meaning of the universe, it can't get to that draw the screen, draw the screen, you know, the user moved the mouse, draw the screen, draw the new mouse. It can't do any of that. And so a lot of asynchronous programs will, if you have a threading library, they'll say, okay, you clicked on this button to submit your information to the website. While I'm contacting the website and submitting the information, et cetera, uh, let's push that off onto a separate thread so that this main thread can continue running. Or let's break this up into pieces. So if you click on, you know, create graph, and it's going to take all this data that you've put into your phone, uh, it's kind of like Excel, it's gonna, you know, fit a curve to your data and display it on screen for you to do whatever with. Uh, it might break that up into pieces. And it might say, you know, 
draw the curve and then the next time it goes through the loop uh, you know find some data the next time it goes through the loop fit the data to the curve and so every time you're going through the loop you're checking did the user move the mouse you're drawing the screen and then you're doing just a little bit of work and so the GUI is actually being halted but it's by such a tiny amount that nobody can notice so these are often the core features you see in asynchronous programming but uh, GUI code is definitely more confusing to read than normal synchronous code yeah, because of these sure. facts. Right. And uh, internet code is, is even harder because yeah. you typically have hundreds, maybe thousands of users all using the same thing at the <laughs> same time. Yeah, which uh, will lead to maybe some stuff we'll talk about in the future, some interesting new directions people are going in web servers and how to handle large numbers of users uh, from one, one program. Yeah, definitely. We should definitely get into some more uh, internet topics in the future. Yeah, so. those are very applicable, and I think a lot of people are out there doing that. And, uh, you know, we should be careful that, you know, when talking about learning to program, which I guess we kind of got off of when we were on Objective-C, but that, you know, a lot of people will kind of uh, fuss at you about your choice. Oh, I can't believe you learned BASIC, or I can't believe you learned PHP. That's not a real programming language. Uh, Sometimes I find that those people tend to be the people that don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and so yep. they're just saying that because they're ignorant and, That's and true. they're threatened or, you know, whatever it is. It's kind of like the people that make fun of you in school, you know, remember those people? It typically because <laughs> they had some sort of huge flaw themselves and they were trying to cover it up by making fun of everybody else. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, it's, so never it's be embarrassed so, by your choice. It's so interesting how. You know, often, like you're saying, the people who are the most despondent are the people who, it's typically that they just don't, they cannot see the benefit of whatever they're, you know, making fun of. But the fact is that all of these languages that we've talked about until now, and likely all the ones we're going to talk about, unless we really start running out of languages, <laughs> are, are very popular and they have an incredible amount of utility. So um, it's, yeah, it's definitely all about worth picking the right tool for the right job. That's right. And if you're so writing we, iOS programs, that's Objective-C. That's definitely the right tool, for sure. So we talked about a lot of the strengths, but maybe we should cover some of the weaknesses of Objective-C. We, we kind of been hinting around the first one that I have, which is yep. that outside of these uses, I, nobody really uses Objective-C for anything. In fact, um, if I if I understand correctly, Apple kind of released the second version of Objective-C language or the C compi Objective-C compiler, or however you want to phrase it, kind of the upgrade. And that's not even supported by anybody else. Like GCC and Objective-C don't support those language features um, yep. because there's just not enough people interested in using this outside of the OSX iOS environment. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the low user base is, is by far the biggest weakness. And, uh, you know, now I think that some people have figured out ways to write, um, you know, apps for the iPhone without using Objective C. I've seen uh, this Corona SDK. It's a development kit for the iPhone where you can write in, I think, C++. And I don't know what they're doing behind the scenes. Yeah, I thought there was something. I, I I'm not that fresh on it. I wasn't prepared for that topic, but. Um, <laughs> I know there was a while where they had something in the license agreement that basically said you had to write an Objective-C with Apple's, you know, uh, deemed appropriate development environments. Right. And uh, you weren't allowed to write in anything else. And I think people kind of fussed, and I think they backed off of it a little. But I think in general that's still their stance is that you're supposed to always run Objective-C or write in Objective-C. Yeah, yeah, I think that... Um you know, it's still 99% of the code on the iPhone, I would say, is Objective-C. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there are ways. I think Boo is uh, like a is a dialect of, of Python, which uh, can be used on the iPhone in some capacity. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in the end, if you're writing for the iPhone, really the best advice is to just have suck it up and learn Objective-C. Uh, we did for writing our iPhone apps. Um, the other One of the other weaknesses I would say about Objective-C is that it's just the syntax is I feel like it's very verbose and complicated um, but maybe that's you know, because we're colored by being C++ programmers first well I feel like that I, but I feel like objectively what I can say is that 
you know, going back to the strengths of Objective C, being you know dynamically and statically typed, uh, having the oh one thing we didn't really talk about was the different property directives. Um, it's very easy to create properties in oh, uh, mm-hmm. in Objective C, but just being able to get that power, um, and you know the um, reference counting, uh, things like that, comes at the cost of the syntax. I feel. Um, you know, I just I feel like I could be objective and say that okay. you know, a language like C, which doesn't have all the bells and whistles, um, you know, has a much simpler to read syntax. But you know, again, a lot of that is because whoa, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. I don't know if we can let that fly. C has a simple <laughs> syntax. Well, have you seen some of the C, C code I've seen? Oh yeah, C code can be terrible. I okay. guess any code can. Be. But maybe maybe this is a more fair statement. Uh, if you're writing for the iPhone, you will almost certainly be doing asynchronous programming. And so, you know, we really, there aren't really any canonical hello world. Uh, you know, there, there isn't a, a large code base of command line, you know, straightforward code written in Objective-C for you to get your feet wet. So chances are, if you're going to learn the language, you're going to take on, you know, an asynchronous uh, uh, iPhone app with many different function calls going all over the place. And I think that's enough to make any language complicated. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. I, I agree that, <laughs> that the language, in my opinion, has a lot of characters that you don't really need. Yeah, and, you know, this is really endemic to a lot of these sort of uh, th- these sort of UIs. I mean, remember MFC and what a disaster that was? Like, it was like application <laughs> layer integer pointer, like, all of those words strung together just to like to name a variable for a freaking button on a UI. And so MFC had this problem. Um, you know, Java, even Java has this problem, like new file reader, and then inside of that, new buffered reader, new IO reader. So anytime you start dealing with, um, you know, GUI user experience kind of things, it's going to become very verbose. And so I think it's just um, the fact that Objective C is only used for those kind of applications. Okay. Uh, means yeah. that you're going to be yeah reading a lot of complicated code. I'll agree to agree with that. <laughs> this oh, isn't man. much of a you know our 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 podcast is programming throwdown. We uh, you know I kind of thought maybe we'd throw it down with each other a little more, but uh, it hasn't really turned out that way. Yeah, well I think that you know every now and then we kind of grill each other. I think that. We should pick a language that has much contention. Maybe we'll do C++ next time. and right. One where, where at least I'm very opinionated. I don't know about you. Well, I, I can take whatever opinion that is opposite of yours. Bring it on. Okay. All right. You are definitely wrong. <laughs> no. We'll so, just have a crying match. <laughs> well, th- well, to close this up, since we're drifting a little, uh, I want to thank all of our listeners. Uh, thank you for those who have written us some emails and... Uh, Uh, written us some good reviews and itunes continue to do that please um that helps us uh you know feel appreciated for doing this this work and uh we we enjoy doing it but uh it helps to know that it's uh, worth it because people are out there listening to it and uh it helps us get even more listeners because it rises us in the ranks so other people can see us so i encourage you please not it's nice to click click the five star review and four stars reviews please five stars and uh, <laughs> but it's it's even nicer if you can write a little message and tell us what you like about it uh, and then if you have something you don't like so much uh, just write the good things in the review and then send us an email uh, or post it on the blog you know your your comments and critiques so we can uh, try to make things better and feel free to, uh, to to post on those we do on our website programming throwdown.blogspot.com You'll find show notes, links to some of the stuff we talked about, kind of a little bit of a recap of our discussion in case you can't remember something later. If you have terrible memory, like at least I do. And yep, uh, okay, and Jason too. And uh, you know, also a link to the podcast if you want to download it. Uh, it looks like most people download through iTunes, but uh, if you want to listen to it on your computer or download it for another device, you can find that on the website. Yeah, and I mean, a shout out to uh, Weston for coming up with the I- both of the ideas for the show for why we decided to start programming and for Objective C. So, definitely, if you have any comments or suggestions, uh, you know, we do have our ears open, and uh, that was a particularly good one. So yeah, can't promise that we'll uh, implement what you say or do it, but we'll definitely read it. We'll definitely listen to it, and we'll probably give you a shout out on the show. Yeah, 
So uh, I think that about wraps it up. All right. Well, till next time. Have a good one, guys. Take care. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.